I do have a pretty significant disclosure to make in that I've never done a lateral surgery on a live patient because I'm not a surgeon. Um, I'm still applying to medical school, but I've been very fortunate to work under Dr. Chapman, Dr. Skui in here and look at some of their cases. So I'm going to tell you about one of our studies here. Um, now, you guys are the forefathers of the lateral approach, so we certainly don't need me to talk about the anatomy of it. Um, but what I'd like for us to draw attention to is on the left here. This is a model from one of our previous fellows, Dr. Pericles Gadolius. And it's really just showing how tightly associated the lumbar plexus is with the psoas muscle. So we've also seen well-reported um, you know, transient weakness, transient numbness, especially on the surgical side, after the trans psoas approach. So what we were wondering is, in the long term, is there any sort of you know, changes in psoas morphology? any sort of lasting uh, plexopathy, weakness, numbness. So in terms of the study design, we looked at all lateral uh, patients from our institution from 2016 to 2024. We're comparing the surgery side versus the non-surgery side on MRI. And we're looking at you know, cross-sectional area, functional cross-sectional area, fatty infiltration, as well as clinical symptoms of weakness or numbness after surgery. We excluded any patients who would have um, any sort of, you know, inflation or deflation of their psoas. So anyone who didn't have sufficient MRI follow-up, any excessive deformity, spinal cord injury, tumors, trauma, or infection. In terms of um, our patient breakdown here, we can see that on the right, the flow chart. We did actually have a significant exclusion. So if you note, almost 80% of patients were excluded from our initial uh, finding because they didn't have images. So only patients who were symptomatic were actually imaged after surgery with MRI, which is pretty significant, and we're going to touch on that later. Um, but we did have a final sample of about 108 patients for us to look at, and we measured both at the standardized uh, level, which is the L4 upper end plate, as well as the target disc space of surgery. In terms of initial findings, there was a lot of variability. On the left here, you could see a patient, this was a gentleman in his early 60s, presented with uh, debilitating bilateral leg pain worse on the left than on the right. Um, so he ended up receiving an uh, L3, 4, and 4, 5 uh, inner bodies, as well as a posterior 3 to uh, S1 uh, fixation. He ended up developing severe um, recurrent weakness and uh, pain in the right thigh. And um, four months later, you could see these secondary images. He um, ended up having to get a revision. He had her needed at L2. He ended up losing about 33% of the psoas uh, cross-sectional area on the right side, so the side of approach, and about 10% on the non-surgical side. Compare that to the gentleman on the right here, also in his early 60s, um, did very well. It was just a 1-2 and uh, no posterior fixation. He actually gained about 20% on the surgery side on the right and about 25% on the non-surgery side. So, we see a lot of variation in terms of time course as well as how patients do. Um, average patient was about 67 in this cohort. Um, about three year follow up and uh, relatively equally matched in terms of sex. So in terms of a histogram of how patients actually do, we don't see any significant skewing. On, on average, it was about 6% decrease specific to the surgery side. Um, no significant changes really in the ipsilateral side. What I'd like to point out with these two graphs here to the right, um, highlighted in red here is the ipsilateral side, so on the surgery side. It's very variable, so it's hard to predict whether patients are going to have a great gain or a great loss after surgery, whereas on the contralateral side, it's much more predictable around the line of best fit. Um, the question then becomes, how do you predict it, right? Like, what was the ipsilateral side? And we found that the only significant risk factor, um, at least in our cohort, was two-level fusions. Um, surprisingly, surgeon, laterality of the approach, location of the surgery, length of stay, and operative time didn't have any impact on whether the patient uh, gained or lost. So that kind of suggests to me that patient lifestyle factors might play a bigger role than the actual operation itself. Here's some uh, statistics on clinical changes. So you can see most patients had no change. The key takeaway here is that there was no side-specific changes in clinical outcomes um, for weakness or numbness. There was a bilateral, very, very minor decrease in terms of strength. So about 10% of a grade on the Oxford scale, 0 to 5, um, on both sides, and no statistically significant sensory changes. So what are the takeaways from this? Um, decreases in psoas size, about 6% on average specific to the surgical side. 
There was decreases in SOAS quality. So on average, it raised about 1%, um, which was a relative increase that was pretty high. But we see minimal uh, clinical changes. So there was no side-specific changes in terms of clinical outcome and a very, very minor uh, decrease in terms of strength. Again, like 10% of a grade, so very minor. Um, does it matter? I would say um, when we're thinking back to our cohort, when we had all those patients who were excluded, who didn't have symptoms, who didn't have images, we're thinking that these patients are going to be you know, much more uh, severe in terms of their recovery. They're going to have a more difficult um, you know, time in terms of symptoms, in terms of uh, like psoas morphology. And yet we still see hardly any sort of you know, significant findings for that. Um, to me, that kind of reinforces the minimally invasive nature of the procedure. Even in the symptomatic cohort, we don't see significant changes. In terms of what that means for our patients, you know, if patients are nervous, if they're anxious about a trans psoas procedure, how that's going to affect the psoas or the lumbar plexus, this data, we can kind of reassure them, you know, even though there's a very slight decrease in psoas size, uh, we're not expecting to see any significant clinical changes that would affect uh, functional quality of life. Um, we talked about a lot of the limitations. It's always great to take this with a grain of salt. Um, we do have a significant sampling bias. We have a staged approach for many of these cases. Um, we do have a large population of surgeons, so we have a large population of techniques, um, which makes it difficult to associate statistical power with surgeon and, of course, neurological examination. Um, now, finally, the last and most important point of this presentation uh, is a lesson from Dr. Eskuyan. He always says to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. And uh, I feel very, very fortunate to be here at SSF and to be able to do just that. Um, so huge thank you uh, to everybody on this slide and many folks who I didn't have photos of um, for everything. Um, my mom has had chronic back pain ever since I could remember, crippling radiculopathy. And so being able to be up here and kind of you know, give back to this community is uh, really exciting and it's really an honor for me. Thank you. Look, thank you. It was a really good paper and very interesting. But I got lots of questions. And I, and I don't know who's going to answer now. One, I mean, I, I like the premise of the study and, and what you're trying to say. How do you explain contralateral changes? That is one, right? Why would you gain muscle mass? That is two. And, 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 and three is, were you able to correlate any of the clinical symptoms to any change in the soul? So they're purely random. If somebody had a clinical change and somebody else had a soul change, any correlation there? These are all really great questions. Um, our discussion section in our writing lab was definitely fraught with a lot of back and forth on why we see contralateral changes. Our main kind of running hypothesis is that if you're having a successful LF, if you're correcting a lot of these symptoms of you know, deformity, um, any sort of pain, maybe a patient's restored to a more active lifestyle afterwards, and that would contribute to uh, you know, an increased sort of uh, like muscle mass on the contralateral side. Um, whereas, you know, the variation caused from the disruption of the trans approach, maybe that affects the ipsilateral side a bit more. Um, so that was kind of our main running hypothesis for the contralateral side there, yeah. What if I throw something at you? What, you, could you? Do you think it could be a variability in the measurement, an error in measurement as you get in? These are hard to measure. When you're it, looking at 6% change in cross-sectional area. It definitely... Um, <clears throat> This is something that I tried to be really careful about. With any measurement, I took it about like two or three times, and every time it was reliable within itself, within like two or three percent of each reading. So it, it was, um, you know, very accurate, at least to the best of my ability. Um, but yeah, it was definitely perplexing our findings a little bit. So let me just uh, thank Luke for. A First of all, congratulations on a nice uh, presentation for your first time in front of a surgeon's audience. Congratulations, right here, interruption, applause. <laughs> and your humility is awesome. Uh, uh, let me just give the uh, uh, faculty here a little premise. This emerged out of a negative hypothesis bias of the speaking person here, of myself. I was sure <laughs> that we would find that the psoas gets maimed. Well. And I was pleasantly surprised on repeat viewings, and we did some independent measurements also to be sure that these are pretty consistent. We've actually done a previous paper that I think is now out on a slightly different subject. 
So SOAS is probably one of the best um, ways currently to assess functionality, status, and sarcopenia of patients. It's reasonably well validated. So I was pleasantly surprised how the SOAS has a bounce back capability. It actually does show and reflect activity level of patients. So surgeon's trauma is less bad than what I suspected. So my null hypothesis was basically confirmed. This is an erroneous assumption on my part. There's some functional limitation, but it's not as bad as, as I thought and can be compensated functionally to address your point. So in a way, I think this should validate that uh, if done properly, like what Dr. Famson nicely pointed out, yeah. and all your uh, hard work has shown and evolved into, this is actually a reasonably forgiving interval. So just wanted to point out the context. No, wait, no, thank Dr. You. Oh, oh, here comes Dr. Pimenta. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's, I'm sorry that I was change, changing myself. I didn't see, but I imagine your conclusion that the psoas, as you manipulate the psoas, you can see that the psoas shrinks in volume. Uh, we, we did long time ago, more than 15 years ago, uh, a study on the function of the psoas muscle with dynamometers. And we found that around 75% of the cases, the function of the psoas where the psoas was worked, reduced. Uh, and that's why we really, at that time, pushed for physiotherapy after the procedure to make the psoas restore the function. I think it's important to know, and this is related also to how long, how difficult the case was, how many levels you do through the SOA, so it's all things that matter, right? Yeah, I think that's a really great point, going back to you know, combining that between what you said and what Dr. Chapman said about like SOAS as predictor um, for patient activity and for patient quality of life. Yeah, another point is that the SOAS, as we know, uh, is much more volumetric at 4.5 mm. than in other levels. So you should expect more problems when you use more aggressive 4.5 techniques. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Dr. Baventa.